Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted that you've decided to join us. As you may know, we're studying the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church, and this series is entitled Revival and Reformation. It's a series for the months of July, August, and September of 2013. This particular lesson is lesson number four in that series entitled Witness and Service the fruit of revival, and it's a lesson for July 27 of 2013. Before we begin, uh, we'd like to encourage you to grab your Bibles. While you're doing that, we'd like to remind you that the materials that we use in our discussion here together are available on our website at theox, that's T-H-E-O-X dot O-R-G. And then, in, as, as usual, we'd like to really begin with a word of prayer. Our kind and loving Father, what a privilege it always is to <clears throat> meet with you, to request the guidance of the Holy Spirit, especially as we talk about these very fundamental issues in Christianity. Help us to understand something more about what it means to share, to witness, to tell others about you. May we have that message clear clearer in our minds, and be more convinced about the importance of sharing it is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Witness and service. What do you think of when you hear witness and service? And we're, we're talking about this in light of revival. Just a reminder, what does revival mean? Bring back from the dead. Come back to life. Yeah, wake up. Whatever. I get the idea of like somebody getting pulled out of a pool. Yeah. And exactly. they do some things to revive them. Revive does them does the back. church need CPR? <laughs> <Is> that, <laughs> that, that's the question here. And maybe so. Um, if we have a deep spiritual experience with Jesus Christ through Bible study and prayer as we're supposed to, Shouldn't that be enough? Why do we need to witness? What happens when you start to share your faith? You find out what you don't know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. I will never forget my own personal experience. When I got all excited, I was attending a, a Bible class, and I found out one of the really core, uh, a new approach to one of the core doctrines of the Adventist Church. And that evening, uh, where I was driving with some people in my car, and I said, oh, let me tell you what I learned today. And I got about halfway through, and I and where did we need to go from there to there? And I couldn't remember. So, yeah, I have that very personal experience with that. Well, you know, Jesus had a deep personal experience with God, and fortunately, he came and shared it. Yes, yeah. Well, often those who really focus on Bible study and prayer end up with a lonely spiritual experience. Sometimes they become critical of others who do not have the experience just exactly like theirs. Some of you have probably met people like that. Of course, such an attitude is anything but Christian. The goal is not just to change external behavior. The goal is to change hearts. So changed Christian hearts lead us to be more and more like Jesus whose constant focus in his communion with his Father and in his prayers was what he could do for others. What was he praying about? Us, the people, others. What he followers. can do for others. His prayers were, okay, Father, what can I do to help these people? Is that what we pray for? Or we is should. it, I need this, I need this, I need this, and please help me with that. that no, of course, none of you ever pray like that, I'm sure. Of course, some yeah, people do pray for these things to help other people. So. John, 15, John 15, 15, he says he was praying to the Father, and he was sharing what he learned from the Father. Mm -hmm. So I take it that Jesus was a teacher. Yes. And not a penalty payer. I've mm -hmm. said that many times before. But. Uh, let me ask you a question about people. Now, we know that there's two types of people. There's an introvert and an extrovert. Mm -hmm. um, do you think that as far as witness versus personal time with God is going to be the same with both those or 
Are you going to, is one going to uh, maybe be more excelled in one yeah. than, than, than the other? What I can tell you, I, I can tell you a story. This was um, a story told by someone that I know personally who was talk, trying to talk about this issue among a group of Adventists. And he said, well, let me tell you about a church I know about. I personally don't know the church. He, he knew this church very well. And there was an elderly gentleman in the church. And he would go around. He just had a compulsion that he needed to share. And he would go to people's houses. He would knock on the door. And he, would, and he was quite elderly. He would knock on the door and he says, Excuse me, I have a book here called The Great Controversy. And I can't really read it very well anymore. I'm too old. Would, would, would you be willing to read me a chapter out of this book? I jump right to chapter 29. Well, no. <laughs> <laughs> he would choose different chapters, and, 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 and they would read, and he would say, well, why do you suppose it says that? And, and he was by far the most successful evangelist in that church. Wow. By far. I think that the introvert and the extrovert basically do the same thing, but they do it in different ways. Mm -hmm. And I think when it comes to witnessing, the introvert will have a different method than the extrovert does, but they will both be talking about Christ. What, what kind of a method can I as an introvert use for witnessing? An introvert? Yeah. <laughs> as, as an example. <laughs> what kind of a, well, a made-up story is this? <laughs> oh, well, don't, really don't you it. think that an introvert probably has more time to think? He may, have a, mm -hmm. he may have a deeper approach to some issues than some other person. I mean, an, an extrovert may come up and tell you all kinds of stories that, that align with something and well, and, you know, they're just different people. They just yeah. do things differently. Jay, I have a, a, a question in response to your question. Uh, when introverts uh, fall in love, do they tell their friends about it? Yes. Um, that's been so long since I had that experience. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure I can remember. <laughs> <laughs> that wasn't what I was a pretty cheap out. <laughs> well, Jay, Jay qualifies as an introvert. <laughs> they do, but they don't tell as many people. Well, that may be. That may be. Well, the question is, are we motivated by Christian love? That's right. Or by something else? Well, God has to put that in our heart because we're not, um, by ourselves, we're not motivated for that. I I look at the news sometimes on my computer, and somebody, I have no idea how they do this or whatever, but they have a little dial there that talks about what they think the status of the stock market is, and it goes from extreme fear to extreme greed. <laughs> <laughs> what motivates our world? Fear? Greed. Where, where's, where's any Christianity in this at all? Anyway, since the days of Abraham, it has been God's intention that his true people would witness for him to all around them. You remember these words, just as, you know, Abraham was the first foreign missionary. The Lord said to Abram, leave your country, your relatives, and your family's home, and go to a land that I'm going to show you. I will give you many descendants, and they will become a great nation. I will bless you and make your name famous so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, but I will curse those who curse you, and through you I will bless all the nations. What was Abraham supposed to do? But well, what happened to Abraham's descendants? Did they become a great witnessing power tool? Well, I, don't, I don't remember Abraham having tent, well, he had a tent, but I don't recall him you know, kind of going out and having tent meetings. It was like, well, hold, you know, my, my experience was, I, I mean, what I recall Abraham did was he traveled around and he lived his life, but he did build those altars. Yes, and, and not only that, <clears throat> he left Ur with a relatively small number of people. By the time we get him to Canaan, sometime later in his experience, relatively early in his years in Canaan, I might add, he was able to send out or, or to lead forth 
an army of 318 men that were just a small part of his employees. Well, but, I mean, that, what that, is that? that could indicate that um, people were attracted to him because of, of his relationship to God or yeah. what God was doing in his life and so forth, but he, <clears throat> that doesn't mean he was actually out canvassing. Or well, he, his version of evangelism might be a little different than what you're thinking of, but he did it. Also, he met up with Melchizedek, didn't he? Yes. He wanted to do some uh, conversations back and forth and learning on that, their parts. Well, unfortunately, the Old Testament experience following Abraham didn't turn out to be all that God wanted it to be, and, and we know that story. Uh, the people were much more prone to uh, adopt the fertility cult religions of the nations around them instead of spreading their good news to the, to the people with the fertility cult religions. So, but you know, we're not Abraham. Yeah. God hasn't talked to us. He hasn't said he's going to make a great nation of us. Uh, so what, how do we become witnesses? I mean, we're out of the Abraham realm. Well, we're but, just common little okay. folks running around here. But l l hold on just a minute. Remember that God says, through you, and he's specifically talking about the church at the end of time, I'm going to finish the gospel. Now, compared to building a nation, finishing the gospel is a big deal. I got a paragraph here okay. that, that I'd like to read from <clears throat> The Faith I Live By, page 150. And I think it talks about the attitude that Abraham may have had. And it starts with uh, a reading of 2 Corinthians 3.18. But we all, with open face, beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord, are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. As the mind dwells upon Christ, the character is molded after divine similitude. The thoughts are pervaded with a sense of his goodness, his love. We contemplate his character, and thus he is in our thoughts all he is in all our thoughts. His love encloses us. If we gaze even a moment upon the sun in its meridian glory, when we turn our eyes away, the image of the sun will appear in everything upon which we look. Thus, it is when we behold Jesus, everything we look at reflects his image, the sun of righteousness. We cannot see anything else. We cannot talk of anything else. His image is imprinted upon the eye of the soul and affects every portion of our daily life, softening and subduing the whole nature. By beholding, we are conformed into the divine similitude, even the likeness of Christ. To all with whom we associate, we reflect the bright and cheerful beams of his righteousness. We have become transformed in character for heart, soul, and mind are irradiated by the reflection of him who loved us and gave himself for us. I think that may be kind of the mindset of Abraham. Exactly how he expressed that, I don't know. But he was pretty successful at it. Yeah. Well, the Gospels tell us. I mean, there's no question about it. I mean, Matthew 28, 19 and 20, Mark 16, 15, Luke 24, 45 to 49, and John 20, 21. Jesus said, as he was finishing his work here on this earth, go, teach, preach, make disciples, witness, baptize, and I will send you the Holy Spirit to help you. These words from Ellen White spell, spell, talk about that a little bit more. The church is God's appointed agency for the salvation of men. It was organized for service, and its mission is to carry the gospel to the world, Acts of the Apostles, page 9. So, uh, we don't have time to read all these verses right now, but Ephesians 1, 7 to 10, and 3, 7 to 10, and Colossians 1, 19 and 20, say that the entire universe is looking at us, and while the universe is looking at us, God assigns us the job of saying something important about Him. How do we do that? Well, you know, we can't go unless we have something to go with. Mm -hmm. And we can't talk to others if we don't, if we're afraid or don't believe in 
And so those are responsibilities of, of ours. Mm -hmm. um, That's why we had prayer and Bible study the last couple of weeks. Now we're supposed to be ready for the witnessing. And what Norm said is the Sabbath to get an imprint of God on our minds so that the other six days that that imprint is on us and then it fades away by uh, Friday and we have to renew it on Sabbath again. Well, uh, it says it's, there's the mind dwells upon Christ. Certainly on Sabbath that should be uh, a, a part of the activity, but it should be also the activity every part, all the time, every day. Why, why doesn't God just say, you people are a bunch of flakes. I'm going to send my angels to do the, to do the witnessing. Wouldn't that just get the job done a lot more efficiently, a lot better? Mm -hmm. Yes, but he'd lose us. <laughs> well, my question I mean, wouldn't, is... Wouldn't, yeah. we be good, wouldn't we be great people to start out with? Let the angels start on us. Angels had to learn from beings of a lower order. We learn from books and videos. The angels learn, which are of a higher order, they learn from us learning. And mm -hmm. they, they learn how evil works and how good uh, love works by observing what, uh, First Corinthians four nine. Mm -hmm. yeah. so. If we're not involved in this, our religious experience withers and dies. Well, and that's so if the we're point. not part of it, he loses yeah. us. Yeah. Well, I'd I'd like to know how would that work if you said, okay, let the angels go do it. I mean, it won't work. Well, yeah, if you try to imagine it happening. Well, no, uh, no. there's all kinds of things that aren't happening with them doing it. Yeah. So, um, well, the way the way it would probably happen, if that were to happen, they would appear as human beings all over this earth, and they would be talk knocking on people's doors, and they would be talking to them, and and so forth, just like we should be doing. But none of them have had a life experience That's right. like like us. They can't procreate. Uh, it, uh, so there, there's a lot of things that that they can't. Uh, communicate because they have never experienced it. Well, but here's, here's, let's look at some real examples. In the upper room, just before the Pentecost, there, we're told there were 120 people there. Okay. The best estimates are that in the Roman Empire at that point in time, there were 60 to 70 million people. Wow. Six, that's just the Roman Empire. We're not talking about Japan and China and maybe northern Russia and who knows, in Americas. Yeah. 60 to 70 million people in the Roman Empire. So that means, what? 500,000 people for every Christian. And that, God and, says... And no TV. And no TV, not only that, no postage service, no postal service, no, tran no rapid transportation. The only way you could get there was walk or go ride a horse, but horse or maybe I suppose a few people rode chariots, but not many. Uh, uh, there was no internet, there was no radio, there was no television, none of those things. Is that proportion to what it is today? No, if you look at, we have, there's something like 17 million Adventists now and there's um, seven billion population in the world. So what's that? Uh, that Twenty-five hundred. So less what, than a thousand. What, looking at those numbers, what's that supposed to tell us, though? Well, it just it just what I'm saying is that even in their day, it it seemed like an impossible task. It just, you know, here we are, a, a bunch of people who were discouraged a few weeks ago. Now God says, go and do it. And, and, and let me read a couple quotes that maybe will help to flesh that out. What special things did God do for his followers that made the task at least seem a little easier? Under, this is words from Ellen White. Under the influence of this heavenly illumination, the scriptures that Christ had explained to the disciples, we've talked many times about uh, Luke 18, 31 to 34, how Jesus kept explaining to them that he was going to go up to Jerusalem and he was going to be handed over to the Gentiles and he was going to die, etc. And they couldn't understand what in the world he was talking about. Well, listen to this. Under the influence of this heavenly illumination, the scriptures that Christ had explained to the disciples stood out before them with the luster of perfect truth. The veil that had prevented them from seeing to the end of that which had been abolished was now removed. And they comprehended with perfect clearness the object of Christ's mission and the nature of his kingdom. They could speak with power 
of the Savior. And as they unfolded their hearers, the plan of salvation, many were convicted and convinced. The traditions and superstitions inculcated by the priests were swept away from their minds and the teachings of the Savior were accepted. Acts of the Apostles 44.1. So then, <clears throat> if I'm not having that effect on these people that I talk to, then I must not have a clear understanding of, of what... Or we're not in perfect cooperation with the Holy Spirit. Well, then they also could heal the sick and raise the dead. Yeah. Um, I have no, that's not that's all. Been doing that. I'm, the president of the General Conference has been doing that. Okay, I'm, uh, that's not all. I'm, I'm reading you another quotation. There were dwelling at Jerusalem Jews, devout men out of every nation under heaven. During the dispersion, the Jews had been scattered to almost every part of the inhabited world. And in their exile, they had learned to speak various languages. Many of these Jews were on this occasion in Jerusalem, attending the religious festivals then in progress. And if you look at the passage there in, in uh, Acts 2, it mentions a whole bunch of languages. Every known tongue was represented by those assembled. This diversity of languages would have been a great hindrance to the proclamation of the gospel. God, therefore, in a miraculous manner, supplied the deficiency of the apostles. The Holy Spirit did for them that which they could not have accomplished for themselves in a lifetime. They could now proclaim the truths of the gospel abroad, speaking with accuracy the languages of those to whom they were laboring, for whom they were laboring. This miraculous gift was a strong evidence to the world that their commission bore the signet of heaven. From this time forth, the language of the disciples was pure, simple, and accurate, whether they spoke in their native tongue or in a foreign language. Acts of the Apostles 39. It's almost like he had dispersed the languages like he did at the tower. Yep. You speak this language or can speak this language, you go where that language is spoken and tell the story. Yep. So this isn't happening today, and that's because... That's my question. That's because... <laughs> Well, uh, let me just read you one more thing that goes with that. Well, first of all, he says it was miraculous. Mm -hmm. So people will do miraculous things by themselves. So doesn't it sound like uh, God's kind of um, hasn't turned the switch on yet? No, I think he turned the switch on a long time ago. And we have literature and we have all kinds of media in all kinds of different well, we languages and we, we need to have. get it out. We don't have that spirit, though, that he was talking about, the miraculous power that goes to everybody. And the question that, is, why not? That's what I said. Well, I think what I read earlier has a big key to that. Well, let me read this. And how successful were the Christians at spreading the good news around the Roman Empire of those days? Pliny the Younger, the governor of, Roman pro of the Roman province of Bithynia, that's in the northern coast of modern Turkey, what was Asia Minor in those days, wrote to the Emperor Trajan around about A.D. 110. Pliny described the official trials he was conducting to find and execute Christians. Quote, Many of every age, of every social class, even of both sexes, are being called to trial and will be called. Now, they're being called to trial because they're being accused of being Christians. Not cities alone, but villages and even rural areas have been invaded by the infection of this superstition, which is what he talked, the way he, what he, way he spoke about Christianity. About 90 years later, around the year 200, Tertullian, I hope all of you have heard of Tertullian, he was a famous early Christian uh, theologian, lawyer, etc., turned Christian, wrote a defiant letter to the Roman magistrates defending Christianity. He boasted that, Nearly all the citizens of all the cities are Christians. Now, I would remind you that 90 years after, 100 years after that, 110 years after that, Christianity becomes so pervasive that it was declared the national religion. Now, something happened. And that was called the former reign. We haven't yet seen the latter reign. What's going to happen in the latter reign? supposed to be an even greater manifestation of the Holy Spirit. They were not afraid to hand out literature that might cause them to go to court. Mm -hmm. And today I think we're too comfortable and we want to be politically correct. 
So we kind of, <coughs> we don't do that because those Christians were being persecuted. I don't think we want to be persecuted. Those people were willing to die. Mm -hmm. They had seen a, basically a miraculous transformation in their own lives. And one of their most powerful witnesses was their own testimony. I mean, look at Paul. Three times in the book of Acts, he tells his story. Well, more, but I mean, we have recorded at length three times that he tells his story. And it has a powerful effect. Now, your story and my story might not be quite exactly <coughs> like Paul's, but we can tell Paul's story too. Um, okay, so you suggested that maybe we we need to want to die in order we need, to uh, we need to no we we need to be so convinced of the truth about God and so on fire for the truth. The on that fire part comes from us from Bible study and prayer from us from Bible study and prayer and the Holy Spirit indwelling in us that we can't keep quiet. Uh, I'm still confused because I've studied a lot in the Bible. I, mm -hmm. I haven't gotten a fire like that. Well, maybe you need more. Well, you can always say that. Well, I mean, I are. could study from, from the time I was born to when I died, and you can say, well, you just didn't do it enough. Well, I guess <laughs> we would look at the, what inspiration says is the results of that study. And if we don't see the results of that study, why shouldn't we question the study part? Paul, remember, said he was so compelled by what he came to believe about Jesus that he called himself a slave. And he did that more than once. Do we think of ourselves as slaves? Well, you know, today's world tends to throw cold water on anybody that's ablaze for anything. Mm. And the Satan is constantly throwing cold water, cold water, cold water. These people seem to be still on fire, even though they got cold water thrown at them. Sure. And um, our blaze just kind of goes poof, and we're just yeah. a bunch of smoke. Uh, so there is a difference, and I don't know what would cause us to be fired up like Okay, so, okay, that's the right question to come to next. And if you look at the, I mean, let's just be honest with the evidence that's in front of us. Where did the change come in the lives of the disciples? When they saw Jesus arise from the dead. Okay, okay. that from, from the rising of the, from the dead through the next six weeks to Pentecost. Right. Or seven weeks, seven weeks to Pentecost. So something happened. So what happened in those seven weeks? They realized who Jesus was? Well, that, that was probably number one. Yeah. They recognized that here, the guy that they had been walking around with, the guy that they had started to think of it might be the Messiah, was not only the Messiah in their way of thinking, the, the Christ who was going to come and lead them against the Romans. He was God. And that changed their thinking. They had to rethink everything they had been taught, everything they had, you know, as we suggested by that earlier passage. Did they finally see who God was? Yeah. Through Jesus. But this is, um, this, was, this was something new that had never been done before. And the people they were preaching to uh, had, I mean, it was an astounding message. Mm -hmm. But I live among Baptists and Methodists, and the entire country celebrates that event uh, at least once a year. Mm -hmm. um, so what is my witness? What is my story? Well, I mean, that's a fair question. Uh, that's a very good question. Um, and, you know, I, 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 my, my response probably would be this verse from Second Thess from Second Timothy. Uh, actually Second Thessalonians, I'm <coughs> sorry. All who oh, Second Timothy. Anyway, all who um, live righteous lives in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. We're supposed to pre preach the gospel. And the gospel mm -hmm. means good news. Mm -hmm. And to me what I find worthwhile is we find out that the good news is about God and the way God runs the universe, and that is in love, and that God is not the way his enemies, and most 
misguided theologians, preacher types, have made him out to be. Mm -hmm. To me, that's, that it makes it worth, worthwhile. And then you want to delve in and find more and more, and then you want to share that. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not your private property, and uh, that's just, if you d just kept it to yourself, you're not even being, doing a good job of being self-centered. Let me try to answer Jay's question of what would I do? And I, by reading three selected messages, 186, <clears throat> we need a power to come upon us now and stir us up to diligence and earnest faith. When baptized with the Holy Spirit, we shall have Christ formed within, the hope of glory. Then we will exhibit Christ as the divine object of our faith and our love. We will talk of Christ. We will pray to Christ and about Christ. We will praise his holy name. We will present before the people his miracles, his self-denial, his sacrifice, his sufferings, crucifixion, and his resurrection and triumphant ascension. These are the inspiring themes of the gospel to awaken love and intense fervor in every heart. Here are the treasures of wisdom and knowledge, a fountain inexhaustible. The more you seek of this experience, the greater will be the value of your life. But the first and two words you said, we need a power. We need a power. She didn't say how to get the power. She just says we need that power. And then everything you read after that was the result of that power. Didn't what we read earlier, though, have no, something to that? As the mind dwells upon Christ, the character is molded after divine similitude. Well, what does the that thoughts mean? are pervaded. That, what does that mean? I, well, I guess the only way you can find out is do it and see what happens to you. I've then you'll know what it means. To do that, Norm. I've been trying to do that, but I haven't seen this great power come down like you were reading there. Well, l l try this one. This is Desire of Ages, page 347. Our confession of his faithfulness is heaven's chosen agency for revealing Christ to the world. We are to acknowledge his grace as made known through the holy men of old. Talk about the Bible. But that which will be most effectual is a testimony of our own experience. We are witnesses for God as we reveal in ourselves the working of a power that is divine. I haven't had that either, Gary, in that kind of dramatic thing that I think it's talking about. But I still think that that is the only way that I'll ever get it is by dwelling on Jesus. And, and that means I have to spend more time at it. I have to be more intense in it. I have to put other things away so that I can do that. I know of no other way. Well, there's a law that you become like uh, yeah. uh, you become like the person or thing that you worship or admire. So if you spend some time, and it's it's a growing process. And of course, part of the learning process is unlearn some of the bad things, yeah. the bad habits we've developed over yeah. time. So what is the most powerful witness? If we are truly the friends of Jesus and can speak faithful and truly about Him, His character, and His government it becomes a witness that even the devil cannot effectively deny. And again, I quote, let us remember that a Christ-like life is the most powerful argument that can be advanced in favor of Christianity, and that a cheap Christian character works more harm in the world than the character of a worldling. Not all the books written can serve the purpose of a holy life. Men will believe not what the minister preaches, but what the church lives. Too often the influence of the sermon preached from the pulpit is counteracted by the sermon preached in the lives of those who claim to be advocates of truth. Volume 9 of the Testimonies, page 21. And then this from the General Conference Bulletin of July 1, 1900, when Ellen White had just come home from Australia. The most powerful evidence a man can give that he has been born again is a new man in Christ Jesus. A and is a new man in Christ Jesus is a manifestation of love for his brethren the doing of Christ-like deeds. This is the most wonderful witness that can be born in favor of Christianity and will win souls to the truth. So you're saying our main duty is to develop ourselves and our Christianness, and then that power will just radiate. 
So That's our main duty like. is to get ourselves in alignment. Mm -hmm. And without that, our words are hollow and even worse than nothing. Mm -hmm. So now, <clears throat> let's assume I'm that way. Which I, way? I have arrived. I am fit that description. Okay. Are you impressed, Gary? Will Gary be impressed with that because he's like me? Who am I supposed to be witnessing this to? What kind of a, well, who am I supposed to be And, and the verse here? that comes to my mind is, is, is Jesus' own words in, in Matthew 6. L look at those for a moment. Matthew 6, I'm sorry, Matthew 5, verse 16. Is part of my problem I'm hanging around with the wrong people? Maybe. Maybe I need to. Well, what do you, how, how does this happen? Matthew 5, 16. In the same way, your light must shine before people so that they will see the good things you do and praise your Father in heaven. So even as a church, even as an entire church, do people, does the world look at us and say, my, it must be a wonderful God they worship? Or do they say, oh, those Adventists aren't bad? I mean, who are we witnessing to? I don't know. They seem to think I'm pretty strange. Do you think that happens when you're more around non-church people than church people? Church people more tear you apart, and non-church people, they see a little bit of good because they're so used to so much bad, and then they praise God. So maybe we need to get out of our um, circle of church people. A good suggestion, yeah. The, uh, part of the pre reason why most of us never get a chance to witness or don't do any witnessings, we never see anybody that's not a member of our own church. Yeah, it's a, I've, I've thought about this uh, myself. You know, I'm a, I'm a church school teacher. Yeah. So, I mean, that's my job is to nurture yeah. uh, my own kind. Yes. Even a preacher gets out uh, yeah. among people who aren't. Well, and once again, Ellen White said, take those young people with you and go out into the community and do some witnessing. That's. So where, where are we along the spectrum of Peter? where on the night before crucifixion, he denied Jesus three times. He was ashamed. Then on resurrection morning, he was excited. And then for the next 50 days, they fellowshiped together, learned. And then he witnessed before the whole Senate, shall we say, the, the Sanhedrin. He was a powerful witness. So. The, the Holy Spirit came upon him during that time, at, at the end of that time, and it changed him. Where are we? We're probably at the beginning of that I pathway. I mm. right. We're not at the end. If you take a completely healthy person and put him in bed and don't let him move for a long period of time, he'll, he'll end up so weak he can't even stand up. How long is that? You say a long period of time. Well, it, 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 would take, it would take a month or two to get that bad. That's really not all that not long. Not that all that long. <laughs> the same thing happens to people who do not exercise their spiritual muscles. Right. Why do you suppose Jesus said it's more blessed to give than to receive? He wasn't just talking about the offerings. What happens if we share our faith? Well, here's a good example that the lesson suggests we should look at. John 6, after this, Jesus went across Lake Galilee, or Lake Tiberias, as it is also called. A large crowd followed him because they had seen his miracles of healing those who were ill. Jesus went up the hill and sat down with his disciples. The time for the past Passover festival was near. Jesus looked around and saw that a large crowd was coming to him, so he asked Philip, where can we buy enough food to feed all these people? Now, they were in a rural area, okay? He said this to test Philip. Actually, he already knew what he would do. Philip answered, for everyone to have even a little, it would take more than 200 silver coins to buy enough bread. And a silver coin was a man's wage, a, a working man's wage for a day. It would take a year's salary, in other words, to feed these people. Okay? Another of his disciples, Andrew, who was Simon Peter's brother, said, there's a boy here who has five loaves of barley bread and two fish, but they will certainly not be enough for all these people. And what did Jesus do? Make the people sit down, Jesus told them. There was a lot of grass there. So all the people sat down. There were about 5,000 men, 
And of course, that's not counting women and children. Jesus took the bread, gave thanks to God, and distributed it to the people who were sitting there. He did the same with the fish, and they all had as much as they wanted. And what was left over? More than they started with. Twelve basketfuls left over when they were all done. So could that kind of experience happen to us spiritually? If we started sharing our faith, would we end up with more faith than we started with? It's a natural consequence. That happens. Yeah. It's a growing, whenever, you, whenever you're sharing in, in anything, you, you, you grow. Mm -hmm. You receive. Our uh, adult Sabbath school Bible study guide says this, witnessing is the gentle breeze that fans the sparks of revival into Pentecostal flames. When witness and service do not accompany a revival of prayer and Bible study, the flames of revival are extinguished and the embers soon grow cold. But what are some ways of witnessing? I mean, what do we do? Pamphlets? Talking? I mean, when we say witnessing, should we give a definition of this is witness? One, two, three, four. Well, you know, I, I've, I've wondered in my own mind about that question many times. What would happen if every Adventist said, okay, I'm going to dedicate a couple of hours on Sunday morning and attend a Sunday church. Go to Sunday school class and just ask some questions. Can I... Uh I've been thinking these thoughts lately, and it kind of fits in here. I, you know, what, the, what those disciples had was that they had the gospel. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering, I'm wondering if, I have been wondering, if we don't have too narrow a view of the gospel. Um, we think of it as just mere salvation, but I'm wondering if the Sabbath the message of the Sabbath, for example, isn't part of that gospel. And I'm wondering, uh, you know, we used to have an urgency. It doesn't seem like we have that urgency so much anymore. Maybe it's there and I just don't see it. But, you know, there used to be something that we were concerned about, about the judgment, mm -hmm. that there was something coming here and mm -hmm. people needed to know this. Mm -hmm. And it seems to me like in recent times we've, We've disenfranchised that from, that, that's not part of the gospel. And I'm wondering if maybe it really is, if we need to, if we need to kind of uh, sharpen up the edges of, of the gospel or something, if we, I don't know, am I, am I just kind of yeah. wandering around here in my thoughts or is there? Well, uh, <coughs> let, let's, take, let's take the example of the disciples once again. What happened when Stephen was stoned? Do you remember? It was a wonderful witness for us. And? Because of his words of mm -hmm. uh, forgiveness for those that were stoning mm -hmm. him, he specifically asked uh, God to not hold the sin against them. Yeah. And, and thus we can learn. We, okay. we learned about his love, um, which he learned from Christ, of course, but that can help us to witness to others, to okay. help us to be gracious, kind, loving, even to our enemies. What, the, happened, uh, to, what happened to the people that were God's followers there in Jerusalem was that they scattered throughout the world and took the gospel with them. That very day, I'm reading Acts 8, verse 1, that very day the church in Jerusalem began to suffer cruel persecution. All the believers except the apostles were scattered throughout the provinces of Judea and Samaria. And what did they do? Talked. Carried the gospel with them. They had that sunspot in front of their eyes everywhere they were. Well, and yeah, which is important, uh, but they were also scattered. Well, yeah, that's right. What would happen to us if every one of us was, I said, okay, fruit basket upset, I'm sending you to Kansas and you to Nebraska and you to We could go anywhere in the world, mm -hmm. but unless we had the sunspot, we mm -hmm. wouldn't be doing the people sure. there any good. Sure. And unless we had the spirit, the power of the Holy Spirit that these people had, we probably wouldn't accomplish much either. Well, the disciples, they were talking about the resurrection and 
this is the Messiah. Mm -hmm. Now, shouldn't we be excited about the revealing of Jesus, which is revelation, mm -hmm. and the whole revealing of Jesus? Uh, should, and should we be excited about the fact that he's coming back? Yeah, and, and so maybe one group is excited about one thing and we're supposed to be excited about another to finish up uh, and as an extension of them. Look at the example of Philip. Remember what happened to Philip? God says, I got a job for you to do. Go down there to that road. He went down there. He didn't know what he was doing. He didn't have any idea what he was going to be doing down there. And he walks along and here's this Ethiopian guy comes along in his chariot. He's royalty. I mean, basically he belongs to the royal household. And what, what happened? An angel guided Philip, we're told, to the one who was seeking for light and who was ready to receive the gospel. And today, angels will guide the footsteps of those workers who will allow the Holy Spirit to sanctify their tongues and refine and ennoble their hearts. That's a, that's a promise. The angel sent to Philip could himself have done the work for the Ethiopian. But this is not God's way of working. It is his plan that men and women, I would add, are to work for their fellow men. Acts the Apostles, page 109. Do we, do we know of any examples when God said, you, I want you right over there. You, I want you. Well, I kind of, maybe I'm getting messages like that. Maybe we're all getting messages like that. Mm -hmm. And we're just, what are we doing with them? We're just kind of uh, figuring out ways to rationalize or something. Well, I remember the time, and I'm not going to tell my whole story, but I can remember the one time that I was <coughs> sort of surprised to me, invited to a cocktail party. Now, you're going to say, what were you doing at a cocktail party? Well. This was a teacher of mine who said he wanted all the class members to come to this. And he said, well, ha you, you can drink whatever you want. I'll have water. I'll have you know, soda. I'll have whatever you want. We just want to come together and maybe get to know each other better. And I told my wife, and she says, well, OK, let's go. Let's, do, uh, let's not be holdouts here. And we went, and I was asked, I hardly, you know, just a few minutes after I walked in the door, I'm asked a question about Christianity. And we spent the whole evening talking about the great controversy, and that person ended up, to be, ended, ended up being a faculty at Loma Linda University. Yeah, but can you have the verbal dexterity of an encyclopedia <laughs> salesman? Oh, <God. laughs> well stated. <laughs> I don't have that. <laughs> well, you've can got to tumble you, over my words. You can at least do as good as the guy who said, I have this great the contact of first city. Could you please read? <laughs> you can do at least that much. <laughs> so Oh, how many might do a noble work in self denial, self sacrifice who are absorbed in the little things of life. They are blind and cannot see afar off. They make a world of an atom and an atom of a world. I think that's where we are in your question. Well, take Moses. He didn't feel he was a good communicator, and yet we have a yeah. good, ch good chunk of the so. Bible from his, his, his uh, willingness to... Uh, to yeah. uh, respond and take it's, instructions. Of course, his willingness. In yeah, the it's, it's a, a willingness to learn. It, it's interesting that he didn't think he was a communicator, but he had already written two books of the Bible. Yeah. We've got to have in the church somewhere, at least some people like this, um, and I don't see this magnificent I, manifestation I, of everything I can that tell we you, seem to feel. If you attended the University Church special okay. service one Sabbath afternoon about a year ago, they had what they called a, a festival of nations, a parade of nations where they, yeah. people came in from all over the world, I mean, carrying flags and so forth. But the main focus of the presentations was what was going on in India. And they talked about how people were spreading the gospel there like wildfire. And the most of the places where the church is growing the fastest is the places where it's against the law to change your religion. And the man said, if things keep going this way, he says, we now have 17 million Adventists around the world. He says, if things keep going like this, it won't be too many years before 
There are 17 million Adventists in India alone. That, that supports my position from this, or my observation, whether I'm right or not. But if, if people are comfortable in their own, uh, their health and their wealth and their social uh, standing mm -hmm. is good, why would you want to look around and see if there's any other options? Uh, you, you apparently have no questions. Mm -hmm. But if you got some stress from outside, maybe if you could find out, some, maybe run into somebody and they, they point you in here, man, you can learn a lot of answers and... Uh, we or others have the opportunity. Let, let's, to let me give you some examples. We know, it, it's sociologically known very well that when people undergo a change of some kind or another, they're much more ready at that point in time to, to, to consider something new. We ought to be visiting everybody new who, visit, who, who comes to the community. Someone moves into the community, we should be at their doorstep. Just as an example, I, I, I think th there's so many things we could do if we really were into it. But we're not. No. And why not? I think the biggest hindrance for most of us is we're afraid of what people are going to think about us. Yeah, you're right. Let's take a brief, honest inventory. When you have an opportunity to witness for the truth, what do you do? Are you embarrassed to speak up? Do you grasp at any excuse for not speaking up? What does your answer tell you about your personal relationship with your best friend, Jesus Christ? Have you had the experience of being led by a pl to a place where you met someone who needed the gospel shared with him? And again, I, I don't know a better place to turn than the writings of Ellen White. In his wisdom, the Lord brings those who are seeking for truth into touch with fellow beings who know the truth. It is the plan of heaven that those who have received light shall impart it to those in darkness. Acts of the Apostles 134. And I continue. God could have reached his object in saving sinners without our aid. But in order for us to develop a character like Christ, guess what our task is? Mm -hmm. We must share in his work. In order to enter in, into his joy, the joy of seeing souls redeemed for a sacrifice, we must participate in his labors for their redemption. I, and I am no no paragon of excellence here, but you know, I, I'm a full-time physician. That's what I do full-time, all week long. And I used to think, man, would I ever have the courage to, let's say, pray with a patient? And I just decided a little while ago that, you know, there's, there's nothing to, you know, to be embarrassed about. And I, I don't even bother asking people what, whether they believe in Jesus or whatever like this. And it's just amazing the people's responses. You say, you know, uh, you know you've got problems and I understand that and da, 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 I have to talk about them. You know, I'd like to pray for you. And people just say, you make me want to cry. It's just amazing. She says, nothing like this has ever happened to me before. And, you know, I haven't told the whole gospel to them. But, you know, it's a simple thing. The paragraph that you just read doesn't make that an option. No. We must share in his work. Another farther down. We must participate in his labors for their redemption. Mm -hmm. It's not an option. So if we don't know, we don't, we're not an encyclopedia of the Bible, but we have a heart for other people, what we can do is when the need comes and keep alert for the need is ask someone if, if we could pray for them. Mm -hmm. Pray and for that, them. That might be our witness. And, and, and if they ask a question, try your hand at uh, answering it. Mm -hmm. And if you have a problem, maybe that means it's time to go back and do some more studying. And I think in our interaction with them, there are opportunities to praise God for what he has done in our lives. And in that thanksgiving that we are giving, they get to observe that. And they may ask a question. You know, we think, man, there are so many urgent things we've got to do. We've got to provide housing and clothing and food and, uh, you know, education for our families. And, man, there are so many things. And I'm thinking, you know, if we really were witnessing for Jesus, 
it wouldn't be very long before the houses and the food and the education that they would provide in heaven would be so much superior to anything we could give them here. Right. <laughs> <laughs> you know, what, 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 what is our goal here? Well, having the privilege of witnessing to someone and having him become a Christian and join the church is positively exhilarating. Why don't more Christians try it? What is the relationship between knowing Christ personally and sharing Christ passionately? A Christianity that does not include active Bible study, prayer, and witnessing easily, easily deteriorates into dead formalism. Uh, I was about to say maybe we should visit some Adventist churches and just see if that ever that works. <laughs> Try to imagine yourself as one of the group gathered in the upper room just before Pentecost. A resurrected Jesus left you about 10 days ago and ascended back to heaven. What are you going to do now? Maybe the words of Jesus in Matthew 28, 19, and 20 are still ringing in your ears. What would you have done? From Acts and his letters, we have a pretty good idea what Paul did. We have a pretty good idea what Peter and Philip did. We do not know very much about the other apostles. What would Paul do in the 21st century? Is it impossible for us to have a Paul-like experience because we are just too busy? And again, I turn to Ellen White. If you will go to work as Christ designs that his disciples shall, and win souls for him, you will feel the need of a deeper experience and a greater knowledge of divine things, and will hunger and thirst after righteousness. That kind of sounds like the Sermon on the Mount, doesn't it? it does. You will plead with God and your faith will be strengthened and your soul will drink deeper drafts at the well of salvation. Encountering opposition and trials will drive you to the Bible and prayer. You will grow in grace and the knowledge of Christ and will develop a rich experience. Ellen White, Steps to Christ, page 80. As we seek to share the truth, it will lead us to a deeper study of the Bible and prayer. And I might, uh, let me finish with these words, again from Ellen White. When separated from those of like faith and compelled to stand singly and alone to explain their belief, many will be surprised to see how confused are their ideas of what they accept as, accepted as true. Certain it is that there has been among us a departure from the living God and a turning to man, putting human, human in place of divine yeah. wisdom. Five Testimonies 707. We're running out of time, but God has commanded us to go out. He has commanded us to witness. Are we ready to take up that challenge? Are we ready to say, I'm not embarrassed, I'll do it.